Welcome to the very first episode of Outliers. I'm your host, Daniel Scrivener, and I could not be more excited about today's episode. On Outliers, we decode what the top 1% of performers have mastered and what they've learned along the way. In each episode, I dive deep to uncover the tools, habits, routines, and hacks that we can all apply in our own lives today. And today, I'm talking to Chris Sparks. We explore productivity versus performance, the power of reflection, and building your own personal flywheel, as well as how to spot the bottlenecks that are holding you back and preventing you from making it to the next level. Chris is one of the top 20 poker players in the world. He's played over 2 million hands of poker and has had 13 first place finishes in his career so far. But that's not all. He's also the founder of The Forcing Function. There he works with many of the world's top entrepreneurs and investors, teaching them how to apply elite poker frameworks for world-class performance in business, investing, and life. Chris is the author of Experiment Without Limits, and soon he's launching an exclusive training program called Team Performance Training. There you can join a small group of ambitious leaders to work through 24 hours of high performance training together, and it includes one-on-one coaching directly with Chris. I've worked with Chris as a coach, and he's incredible. I would highly, highly recommend it. If you're interested, you can learn more at theforcingfunction.com. Without further ado, please enjoy this wide-ranging, all-over-the-map conversation with Chris Sparks. So Chris, I am so excited to have you on the show. And to kick things off, I wanted to share a little bit of a background I was introduced to you, I think about three years ago now, from our mutual friend, Zach Cantor at Steady. The context that I had then was Zach said he was working with a productivity coach. And immediately, my first thoughts were, one, I don't know what that means. <laughs> and then my second thought was, but I'm super interested. And, and I think the thing that you know stuck out for me is I feel like so many, when people think about coaches... So many people immediately jump to this concept of like a life coach and it's someone maybe to help you in kind of an amorphous way. And my experience working with you is very different from that. You know, I would consider it almost like working with a personal trainer that's there to kind of like watch you perform, help give you feedback. And I took so much away from working with you and there's so many things that I still apply in my daily life. And so with that, you know, can you share a little bit of a background around, you know, the type of coaching you do, the type of clients you work with and, and how you work with them? Oh, hey, guys. And yeah, Daniel, thank you so much for that intro. Um, it's super exciting to be here and talk about some of my favorite topics. So I'll take a quick step back as far as, you know, who I am. I'm most known for being a poker player. As Daniel mentioned, I once was one of the top poker players in the world. I'm still pretty high up there, but it doesn't consume all of my time as it once was. My primary focus for the past three years has been my consulting company, The Forcing Function. And I like to think of my day-to-day role as deconstructing the commonalities of peak performance. So I'm privileged to work one-on-one with some of the most successful founders, executives, and investors in the world. And I try to both deconstruct and distill down what allows them to be successful into principles that I can share widely, as well as try to identify things either from my personal experience operating at the highest levels of poker or just from observations and patterns I've observed across their peers of ways that they can accelerate their performance even more. As Daniel mentioned, the word coach comes with its own connotations, good and bad. And I like to think that what I do is innately quantifiable. We're getting on the same page as far as a North Star to head towards and finding a way to track progress towards that goal. And I really think that that's a good way to think about the difference between productivity and performance. Where when I first started, you know, back when Daniel and I met, I would definitely thought of myself as a productivity person. That led to having a lot of conversations around tactics and tools and habits. I think all of that stuff can be useful but it is rarely the highest leverage intervention. And now I think of what I do as much more performance, which is there is a goal or a destination that someone is trying to reach. And I see my job as the third party objective observer to help them reveal the most direct path 
towards that goal, that we can achieve anything if we become the person capable of achieving that goal. So identifying a more effective path to get there, which sometimes is not the most productive path, right? It can be quick and dirty. It can require changing what that goal looks like or the paradigms even used to shape that goal, as well as uncovering all of the roadblocks known and unknown along the way. Yeah, it's almost sounds like maybe one way to think of it is you've kind of had your own transformation in your own journey of kind of thinking about it maybe a little bit more one-dimensionally. And now it's much more like quantum physics where you're thinking about all these different realms, how they intersect, how they feed into one another. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it's means against ends. And I think a lot of productivity is almost a, a gateway drug for people in that there's this fascination of if I master this tool, if I acquire this habit, all of my problems are going to go away. And, you know, I like to say that we're, we're the common denominator in all of our productivity struggles that, you know, no tool, no system, no new routine is going to change anything. It's like until we, we ourselves change. And it, it became realizing that all of my knowledge wasn't actually changing the results. I couldn't just tell someone step by step to follow something, there was an experience that I needed to instill or incept them with in order to instill a new principle that allowed them to make those types of decisions on their own. I see myself as kind of post-productivity, where I look back a few years ago and kind of my obsession with all of these tactics maybe is instrumental, but certainly not the way to instill or accelerate change the quickest. I think that's a wonderful way to encapsulate it. As a a little bit of an aside, you know, I feel like my own journey has been very similar where I feel like for a while, just focusing super myopically on productivity. And it, it felt to me kind of in hindsight, like it was almost taking the brute force approach to trying to get more done, where you're just focusing relentlessly on how can you push yourself harder? How can you potentially get more things done instead of going up a couple layers and operating a little bit more strategically or being able to navigate up and down? And, you know, what I've come to over time is, you know, one way that I try to think about performance personally is almost as a reciprocal loop just this concept that there are different things, different skills that you have to master that each feed into each other. And some of them may seem counterproductive if you just focus on just that thing. But if you bring all of them together and if you can learn how to be good at each, you can get to something really special. And, you know, one way that I think about that is almost as, you know, you take planning, you take performance, you take recovery, and you take reflection. And I think when you do those things in a kind of a reciprocal loop, there's something really special that comes out the other end. And what ends up happening is you end up being a better performer on a lot of different levels as opposed to potentially just getting more, quote unquote, tasks or more things done in a given day. Yeah, I I love that systems thinking approach. I do think a lot of things can be thought of in terms of loops. And, you know, the loop that you described, the planning, experimentation, reflection loop, I think is key to the acceleration of any skill acquisition to the acquisit to the achievement of any goal that the tighter you can run through those loops where you come up with a plan you collect data by you know experiment you act you see whether your efforts are leading to your desired results and then look back reflect what did i learn what would i do differently what could i have done differently the tighter that process of going between planning experimentation and reflection that determines the speed with which you do anything. And, you know, speed kills in this sense, not that we're competing against anyone, right? All of life is a single player game, but to the extent that we all have ambitions and things that we want to achieve and that there are things that we can do, actions that we can take personally to achieve those, that is the hack. That is the trick to constantly be planning, experimenting, reflecting. And the faster that we can iterate through those, the faster that we can do anything. Going a little bit higher level and not thinking just tactically about productivity, but zooming out a bit and thinking about holistic performance is what I found, at least in my own life, is a lot of uh, my failure modes where I'm in a moment where I don't feel like I'm making the progress that I would like to make, or I feel like I'm at a roadblock The thing I found most helpful in that loop I described is specifically reflection. And maybe just to talk about that for a second, I find when I talk to leaders, executives, entrepreneurs, that 
for a lot of people, reflection doesn't come up. It's not, it's not even kind of a, a thought. And what I've moved to just, I borrowed it initially from the CEO of Front. And she shared a little while ago a, a framework that she uses where she spends one day per week and she blocks off an hour, maybe two hours to spend on reflection. And, you know, when I started doing that initially, it felt like, oh, wow, this is a huge miss. You know, one day per week, I'm going to take two hours of my day, effectively a quarter of my day. And I'm not going to be doing and I'm going to be reflecting, but there's a bunch of really counterintuitive, amazing things that come out of that. Like it's a time to ask yourself questions like what opportunities maybe am I aware of, but I haven't recognized and I'm not capitalizing on. And I found that to be one of the most effective, one of the most helpful things I do every single week. How do you think about reflection? How does that show up in, in, in your work? I agree. This is something that I is vastly overlooked and a couple of one-liners that I always like to try to distill this down to. And I think that achievement of any goal is a constant iterative process. You're always course correcting. And so implicit to that is having that feedback loop that we were talking about before, or are my efforts leading me to my goals? Not only am I going at maximum speed, but am I going at the right vector? But I think many people think more about efficiency rather than like, am I actually doing the right things? And I work with a lot of executives who claim that literally every single day, every single minute is booked and there's no time to be extracted whatsoever. And the answer is always, well, you would if you had prioritized them. But consciously or unconsciously, you've decided to prioritize these things at the expense of these other things. And so the way to maximize one uses their time is to make sure that a higher proportion of their time is going to their highest priorities. And I think that reflection is the best opportunity to do that. Daniel, I, I know you being an investor, I'll drop out an investing metaphor on you as I think time is kind of like an investment portfolio and in that certain times our portfolio becomes overweight towards one part. So we over prioritize to one project at our company because of a deadline or because a client is screaming at us yep. and, you know, another part of our portfolio becomes neglected. And so that reflection allows us to take a step back and say, well, how can I rebalance this portfolio is the way that I'm spending my time currently in line with my priorities. And that's a kind of implicit to performance. Everything's a cycle of sprint and rest. Really important for that rest is consolidating lessons so that those times that we actually are operating at full leverage on the right things we can be performing at the best, that it's much better to be operating at a 10 out of 10 for a couple hours a day. I honestly think that no one actually can do more than four hours of good work a day. And the rest of the day is what should I be spending those four hours on and kind of clean up maintenance systems improvement? I mean, there's a lot of people out there trying to work 12 hours a day at a, at a fairly low level on fairly low leverage things that aren't actually moving the ball forward. And so it's kind of counterintuitive, but anytime I work with a client, I have them list out all the things that they're currently doing. And I just like, put a line through half of them. It's like, these are the things that you are no longer going to be doing. And it's kind of like the more wood behind fewer arrows approach because you have that arbitrage where all of a sudden I'm working on things that are higher leverage. I'm not working more, I'm actually working less, but I'm having more results. That's very hard for people to do or internalize. And so for me, that's like the one hour of the week that I treat as this is the most important hour of the week. Every month I take three hours to step back and say, well, of these things that I'm working towards, what's on track, what's off track, those things that are on track, is there a way that I can double down? Hey, this is like going really well. Everything that I'm doing is having excellent results. Can I do that more? Things that are off track, ask, hey, is this actually still a priority? Like the easiest way to clear up time is just to decide not to do something anymore. And as you said, like if you can keep that loop tight, you know you're constantly improving. And that's the only thing you need to solve for. If you know that you are improving in the right areas, you don't have to do everything else. Like the score takes care of itself. But you have to be in it for a super long run because it's a lifetime process. 
you shared a ton there. I mean, a couple of things that just spring to mind for me is it feels like, you know, focusing on performance, kind of taking time to reflect is almost a, a, this kind of never ending process. At least this is the one, one of the ways that I try to think about it of becoming the person that will get better opportunities, becoming yes. the person that will be more effective. And you're, that is really the meta goal you're working on. It's not just getting more done at my particular job or taking this thing I would like and taking it from zero to one. It, it's working at that meta level. So one thing I have to ask is just a follow-up question on that. It sounds like you do some sort of weekly reflection that's a little bit more brief, and then you do some sort of more in-depth monthly reflection. Can you share what that looks like, you know, weekly, monthly, and I don't know if you do one quarterly or annually, but just kind of how you think about that and then maybe give us a sense for some of the questions you might ask or some of the things you might think about at each of those moments in time? Yeah. So I'll start with the questions because I think from that seed, you can build out a lot of the structure. I try not to get too specific by my own routines because I think the temptation is to take something on wholesale rather than build it up from the ground. The three questions that I think all reflection reduces down to is what's going well, what's not going so well, what did I learn? So, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory, like what's going well. The key there is celebrate what's working. We rarely reward ourselves or really acknowledge all the things that are, that are going great. And that's a lot of sticking to something and not burning out is recognizing like, hey, the things that I'm doing are leading to results. They might not be at quite the speed that I'd like, but it is clear that things are different because I am doing things. Yeah. Um, and so as you acknowledge the things that are going well, the wins, automatically you bring awareness to opportunities to double down in those areas. I think all reflection kind of is about like double down or stop. And so the things that are going well, well, anything I can do to make that going even better. So, you know, I'm in the best shape of my life. I, I feel amazing. You know, I work out for, for 30 minutes a day and it's like, oh, I don't have to do much else. And it's good. It's like, oh, you're getting that with 30 minutes a day. Well, what if you did 40? Or what if instead of doing, you kept 30 and you upped the level of intensity a little bit, right? There's always something that you can do. And a lot of times the answer will be, no, I'm pretty happy with this. I think, I think on average, like consistency is key. So yeah. if there's something that you can stay consistent with and you think this is like clearly, clearly not the bottleneck, clearly it's not something that's holding us back. Well, great. Like let's, let's put that aside and, you know, move on. But sometimes you'll identify, oh, I can do this tiny change and I'll have even more results. It doesn't require much effort, but it has a big output, has high leverage. I'll give kind of like an example for each of these, maybe to, to illustrate them a little bit. So I've been working on solidifying my meditation practice for, for a long time. It's been my most inconsistent habit. It's like I rationally, I know that this is something that is going to extend to everything that I do. Presence in conversations, you know, as a poker player, my job is to make good decisions. And so the extent that I can be in the room and fully mindful of everything that's going on, I make better decisions, I make more money. It clearly ties to my bottom line, much less, you know, you don't even get to like enlightenment and self-actualization, all that other fun stuff, but I couldn't stick with it. And so it's like, well, like the times that, Meditation is going well. The times that I do it, it's going well. But I'm not, I'd like to do it for longer and I like to have more intensity with it. And so what did I do is I just found someone who, you know, is like a, a meditation teacher. And he, you know, he talks about meditation. He gives good frameworks. He's a, he's a Buddhist scholar. And we just sit on Zoom and he sort of like watches me meditate in my chair. And that, that feels weird, but it's like just the aspect of someone watching me sit yeah. with my eyes closed is like, all right, I, I know, obviously I'm going to show up because it's a call, it's on video. I'm going to be, you know, dressed and ready to go. But that whole time, the 30 minutes we're on, I'm going to be making the most of that time and really intensely thinking and be acting in a metacognitive way. And then I'm thinking about my experience and, you know, cause I want to have a question. I want to have, I want to have something to share. And so that just simple change, putting that forcing function in place, turn, you know, what was already a win into something that's like exploding gains. And you know, this yeah, has been, amazing. you know, my best year of poker in a long time. Um, like having all of these just like ideas pop into my head and it's like, it's wild. So number two, what's not going so well. So this is never as fun. And so that's why whenever someone's doing like a longer term review, so you're talking about longer time scales, so like a 90 day or an annual review, 
I'm like end of day one, you know, let's celebrate all the things that are going well. And then I'm going to step back and like need a little bit more time, different mind space for what's not going so well. And this usually bears down to what are the things that I quote unquote should be doing that I had in my plan, but that for whatever reason aren't happening. And usually my default decision is I'm just not going to worry about that anymore. Like don't care. Like this other thing is not as high of a priority. And so just put it on my mind, not, not worry about it. Sometimes it's, well, this actually is a really high priority and it's not good that it's, this isn't going well. And so that comes down to, well, what's something that I can put in place to make this more of a default? Usually that's like some form of calendar blocking or creating constraints around the things that I'd like to do instead, creating some accountability around it. So maybe I'll have a public goal or you know launch something that, that creates a deadline. Or to the, the other extent, it's thinking about, well, what am I doing instead that's a lower priority? I'm going to stop doing that instead to make space for this. Sure. But just j- making some change that changes my probability of this going better. This leads into number three, which is what have I learned? And so this could apply to number one or number two, but this is just like, hey, the things that are going well, what are those conditions that allow it to go well? Hmm. What are the con- How can I repurpose those conditions towards something else. If I found, you know, this structure of having accountability around meditation works, well, can I extend that accountability structure to something else where, okay, I, now I do that with workouts where I do those over Zoom and all it is is just like, I have an appointment that I have to show up for and I work out instead of sometimes skipping. It's like this thing that's working in this other area of my life, how can I export or repurpose that? Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that we find these patterns once they keep popping up in our life, both good and bad, right? What we do in a previous context, we tend to repeat in other contexts. And so the nice thing is that if we learn something that works for us, all we have to do is just find other contexts and wish it will work. And so the muscle that I find really valuable here, it's it's almost like a cheat code. It's like, it's like a mental time travel is the way that you save maximum time is to make mistakes and simulation rather than reality. I love so that. like once you discover a pattern and say, well, that's interesting. If I, all I do is just say like today, I'd like to have a workout and well, what, what are the chances I think that's actually going to happen? Well, you know, based on past experience, maybe that's like a 50% chance. You know, it depends on how I feel, what I ate, how I slept, all these other outside factors. It's like, well, what can I do to get that from 50% likelihood to 70% likelihood? It's like, oh, well, I, you know, I set an appointment where I'm meeting with someone or I even I choose the time or I have everything set out, like my workout clothes, et cetera. Oh, all of a sudden it's like 80% likelihood of happening. And like that time didn't have to elapse. I didn't have to go another month to discover that worked. I just had that simulation in my mind and just my confidence level. This this works as like investing as well. If I get above that 70% threshold of I'd be really surprised if this didn't occur, then I'm like, okay, good. I can move on to the next thing. And that's how you you identify like what's the core cause or what's a really key intervention that we can put in place to ensure that our future actions are in line with our present goals. One thing I think that is not talked about enough kind of in productivity or just any area of life is that we are all wired incredibly differently from like we're motivated by different things. We're driven by different things. We have things that excite us. We have things that repel us. And I think that so much of performance as opposed to just productivity is, you know, a lot of that is just this never ending experiment to figure out more about yourself and put that into use. And so what I love just about that as well, too, in my own experience, when I kind of had that aha moment was achieving more became no longer was it about beating myself up for all the things that I wasn't doing well and all the things that were going poorly, but it was much more this exercise of like, no, there's, I'm not broken. There aren't all these things that need to change with me. I just need to listen and take in a lot of information, do a bunch of experiments in the areas of my life that where I really want to move the needle in, know and kind of understand what works well for me and then embrace that. And that becomes a process of one, it's much more compassionate. (laughs) You're actually loving yourself in that process. But I think the other thing too, is it just seems so much more effective. Yeah. I mean, the emotion driving not only is, let's say curiosity versus guilt or judgment, not only is it more effective, also makes life a lot more fun, right? The habits, goals, our companies, 
ourselves, all these are instrumental. And it's, it's, it's good to remind that, right? Like the longer the time scale, the more that we can excuse short-term lapses as inevitable and try to extract the lessons from them. So hopefully we don't pay tuition over and over again. We've already had the lesson once. Let's try to put it in, in practice. When it's no longer pass or fail, which is another yes. thing that I find that I, I just love about that is you're just playing a different game. Yeah, all these dichotomies are false dichotomies. And it's it's converting this this finite game of I'm trying to accomplish this goal, I'm trying to build this habit into the infinite game of, you know, I want to just I want to live a good life. And all of these are steps towards that. And these are all lessons that we use towards that that infinite game. And the notion of not paying tuition multiple times, I think is is really useful because like you said, in a certain way, right, there's prescriptions or principles that tend to generalize across people. So generally, you know, starting with your most important thing tends to work really well. Doing deep work before doing more reactive work tends to work really well. There's certain principles that you can use and adapt to make your own. But a lot of performance versus productivity is what are the conditions that work really well for me? How do I, how is my best self show up. When I've gotten things done in the past, what are the commonalities there? And can I put those back into place? That's kind of one of the trick questions that I have that has a lot of mileage as I ask up front is like, think back to the time that you were most quote unquote productive in your life. You know, what did that, what did that feel like? List out five things that you were doing then that you're not doing now. So maybe you were waking up earlier. Maybe you worked on this project first before other projects. Maybe you had friends who we were working on it and collaborating with. Like, just identify like any, you know, that those games where it's like spot the difference. You have the two pictures and you're circling in one of the pictures yep. where there's there's something in one of the photos and not. Just like what was different at the time, and like that's the low hanging fruit. That's the place to start. Was you already know what was working well for you? Like start there. Like you don't need to find a solution outside of yourself, you know, read another self-help book, scan Twitter. Like those are things that are working for other people. All of their yeah. advice, even everything that I'm saying today comes from my own personal experience, right? Knowing thyself starts with knowing what works well for yourself, starting there. One thing that I wanted to come to, the overarching concept of thinking more about second and third order consequences or second and third order impacts and not first, and just to maybe try to tie a couple things together. I have long neglected exercise in my life, and I've tried to make a massive course correction there over the last year. The whole thing just seems really silly to me. And now in hindsight that I've got it working, my overarching thought is like, wow, this, there's no reason this couldn't have happened sooner. But I think the couple of things that unlocked it for me is just changing the way that I thought. So as a couple of examples, you know, previously, my whole idea was like, I just need to make it to the gym for an hour. That's the only thing I'm going to focus on. I need to make it to the gym for an hour. And then my goal is to try to do that as many times per week as possible. And I would just fail at that again and again and again. And I would try to think about like, okay, well, what is it there? Do I need to have, do I need to wear my gym clothes to the office? Do I need to have a time on my calendar? One thing that I love that I've just been thinking a ton about, and it you know relates to exercise, is there's a concept in exercise of this kind of minimum effective dose. And those words I love. There's a whole other body of research that's just around the, what is the least amount that you can do to still see the benefits. And I think that's just an amazing exercise. But the way I took and latched onto that was just this notion that I don't need to go to the gym for an hour. I focus on little things. And so some of the things I've been practicing is like, every hour, I'll try to stop and do 100 jumping jacks or 40 air squats or, you know, and then I have a dumbbell or barbells or a kettlebell in the office and I'll try to do that. And if you just literally do five to 10 minutes at a time and you space that out throughout the day, you can get an amazing workout. You show up more energized to your next meeting. What are some of the common pitfalls you see of people getting stuck at that first order analysis phase and not moving on or viewing things from that second or third order? Oh, man. I mean, there's so much good stuff there. I just want to underline a couple concepts which you highlighted there. I think as first as you introduced this, this binary outcome, right, either success or failure when there's a whole lot of gray in the middle and that a lot of us, especially high performers, I think the higher the performer that you are, a lot of what makes us have outlier type outcomes if inversed 
become leads to outlier negative outcomes. And, you know, we turn, we turn inward, um, become judgmental. Our greatest strength could be our greatest weakness sometimes. Knowing that a lot of us have this dichotomous black and white thinking, I think an easy way to get around it is making so we we cannot fail, right? Making the bar so low that we can't say no. Yep. This is something that's commonly talked about in habits. I think a lot of behavior comes down to to building a habit, right? You stick with something for long enough in order to start internalizing the benefits and to the point that it becomes part of your identity and you no longer have to try to do it. It's just, you just do it. But that's that's a long process. And as we were saying, thinking of this as an infinite game, thinking of like wanting to get and stay in shape and be in our bodies for the rest of our lives is something we're going to be continuously improving upon. It takes a lot of the pressure to have immediate results. And I think in a, in a figurative sense, these expectations become a prison for us because we are constantly judging, well, I should be having more, I should be doing more. Why am I not having the results that I like. Instead, we trust the process. We think about how can we get started? How can we take one more step? There's this notion, especially in Silicon Valley, of these quantum leaps or, you know, 10Xs. And I think when it comes to the self, it's incremental, but all the time, right? This yeah. 1% every day. You never underestimate the power of compounding. And I think with working out, it's much harder to go from zero push-ups a day to one push-up a day than it is to go from one push-up a day to 100. It's very easy to add on once that initial micro habit has been built. And so, you know, floss one tooth, do one push-up, right? five minutes, right? So start super small to the point that you can't say no, because a lot of the internalization of the benefits takes a long time and it takes consistent input, right? You start to build correlations. Like when I do this habit, this is how my day goes. When I work out versus I don't work out, when I get eight hours versus when I don't eat hours, it takes a while to internalize that difference. And so it's important to stick with it long enough in order for that difference to be apparent. And that means really starting small. In an actual sense, this is the heavy lift that I think a lot of people fall prey to. Say, you know, January 1st, 2021, half the world's like, this is the year that everything changes. And this is the classic, like we fall to the structure of our systems, right? We always will take the path of least resistance. And if all that we've done is just draw up this store of willpower, which is sure to expire as soon as the context isn't perfect, then we're never going to stick with something. And so that means rising above the level of our system. It's like, how can we create supporting structures so that this thing that I want to add into my life can become a default, can become trivially easy? And you know, releasing this expectation of short-term results because we're thinking on such long time scales that having results right now really doesn't matter. So full of transparency is like I, I had never even seen the si inside of a gym until, let's see, 2011. So, yeah, at the age, age 21, never even been inside a gym. That was like it was a big leap for me. And what finally got me over that hurdle, other than seeing like meeting other professional poker players is when I started my, my ramp up the ladder where, oh, like me sitting all day in a chair, drinking two liters soda every day, eating pizza. And these guys are like jacked and they're actually able to play long sessions and make good decisions and not tilt. It's like, oh, this would be worth a lot of money for me to, to go into the gym. But that wasn't enough to get me there. It's seeing that, well, if I do this, over the course of a lifetime, what am I going to look like at age 80? Like I might actually add decades of high quality of life onto my life. I want to be peaking when I'm 80. I don't want to be at my peak now. And so that's what really hit me is like the sooner that I can install this habit, the results now are great, but results in 50 years of compounding, like that's, that's going to be insane. And I think having that long-term mentality really helps because you're going to miss days you're going to travel, you're going to have things that come up. And if you have that all or nothing approach, that's when people completely fall off. It's the difference between a sprint and a marathon is if you're in it for a marathon, like sometimes, you know, your legs are going to cramp, you're gonna to have to slow down to a walk, you're going to get off course, but you, you just pick up where you left off. So 
Next, I'd love to try to get a little bit more tactical, you know, come down a couple levels and just cover the idea of planning and why planning is important, what that prepares you for. If we just think about kind of type A personalities, they think about planning and they're like, absolutely a waste of time. Like, why would I plan when I could just jump right into action? And at the end of the day, it's all about the action and that's how I make progress. But I don't think that's the case. So kind of what is your take there and and how do you think about that and frame that up? (laughs) <laughs> We've been talking a little bit about meditation. I, I like the phrase, um, you know, meditate for, for 20 minutes a day. If you don't have 20 minutes, do it for two hours. <laughs> right? It's like the, the fact that you don't have time to do something means that it's actually more important that you, be, you have a bigger problem. You should be spending more time on it. That's a common thing when I work with executives is, you know, not doing this planning that could be at the micro level of, you know, what am I going to accomplish today before the world catches on fire? I need to respond to these other things that are coming at me or at the more macro level, you know, what's our 90 day North star? What are we trying to accomplish? What are our key objectives and how do we track progress towards those? I think first is just treating that time. Like it's the most important that other things come second where you have limited time, it becomes even more important to decide where that time goes. Because by definition, you're having to say no to some things that are good, that have positive expectation in order to have opportunities which are better and have even higher expectation. And those won't always be obvious in the moment. It requires taking that step back. So that's a lot of where I start is trying to force someone to slow down to create slack in their schedule. It it always takes a client off guard when I mandate that they take a day off, you know, no phone, find a cabin in the woods, just bring, bring a journal and just, you know, just write and just get things out of your head. It's so easy to get tunnel visioned as an executive um, because there's all these things that are screaming for our attention. And, you know, just like our ancestors, on the prairie were very geared toward change. Things that are yelling at us to be done, all of the urgent, that's what that's where our attention is always going to be drawn if we don't know what we're looking for. And so because I've done that planning, I'm able to know what to look for and thus handle a lot of things coming at me at once. And the same is true for every executive. By deciding what's important, you're implicitly deciding what's not important, what's okay to be ignored, what to hand off, what to delegate, what to put off until next quarter. And the less that these trade-offs, because they're always trade-offs, right? You're giving off something that you want in order to get something you want more are made in advance. You're always going to be going towards the newest, shiniest object. My brief time in the startup world in in New York, where I led marketing for a uh, startup that will go unnamed, uh, the founder had this classic shiny object syndrome, where the latest article that he had read or the latest campaign that we had run on the marketing side, you know, we have a days of results and all of a sudden, this is the new thing. This is where we're gonna drive all of our focus towards. Everything we were doing, we can forget about that. This is the new thing. And imagine that this is happening on an everyday basis. And this is what this is the way a lot of us live our lives. And every day is a new priority. And it's very easy to fall into this ping pong mindset as an executive where whatever is happening is the most important thing at the time rather than being deliberate and slowing down. And so the question that I would say to him is like, cool, that does sound like a great idea. That does sound really important. This is what my top priority was. Is it more important than this thing that I was already doing? And usually that question is like, well, no, I guess what you were doing is is more important. It's like, good, let's put that to the side. We stick it in our someday maybe in GTD terms and we keep our eyes on the prize. And a lot of focus is seeing the object of your focus in everything because you know what to look for. You're, you're attuned to that signal. You're aware. And so the way that we improve our focus is we put our blinders on. We have constraints. This is what we're focused on. And by definition, everything that's outside of the circle is not things that we're concerned about, and thus we can ignore them. And there's a lot of power in moving very quickly by knowing what to ignore. And I think that's the biggest benefit of planning is not only are you deciding what you're doing, but you're deciding what you're paying attention to. That's an amazing encapsulation of it. 
one of the most helpful things that I find just for myself is making sure that even if I only have two minutes or five minutes to dedicate to it, because when you become a certain age, you have family, you have other responsibilities, you don't always control your, your time and there's more things that can that can pop up. And so, you know, my mornings, I'm not always able to kind of sculpt my mornings uh, maybe the way I would like, but what I, the kind of rule of thumb I try to follow is, you know, I have to spend some amount of time putting together a plan for the day. And it feels like the two things I'm really doing there is one, it's almost this mental act of setting a goal and almost rehearsing in my mind how the day is going to go, which I find super helpful later on. But then you are you alluded to the second piece, which is, I think all of us need constraints. Uh, my take is, you know, the more driven you are, the more energy you have, the more of a go-getter that you are. I think those people need tighter constraints, not looser constraints, because there's just more, they see almost an infinite number of places they can kind of put their energy and attention and focus. So it's this natural act of constraining, but one way I might draw that out, Ray Dalio has a really interesting principle that I love in his book, Principles, uh, where he talks about just this notion that, you know, you almost want to think about making progress as like a funnel. And so at the top, you have kind of your overarching goal, then you have your strategy, then that breaks out into individual tasks. And one sentence that he says, but it's just so powerful is he's like, and when you think about it in that context, you know, your strategy should change less frequently than your tasks and your goals should change less frequently than your strategy, which should change less frequently than your tasks. And so it's really helpful to think about it in that context too, that your goal should be changing pretty infrequently. And that should be a pretty hard constraint. It should take a lot for you to be able to move that. And to me just stood out as like, wow, it's a really powerful way to, to frame up what you're trying to do there and how those pieces interconnect. One of my favorite Dalio quotes is, you know, life is a big giant buffet. You have to give up some things you want at the buffet in order to eat some things you want more. And I, I think that what you talk about encapsulates a few other very important principles. The first one is another benefit of having a plan is you have something to compare to, right? It's hard to know how the day went if you didn't know how it was supposed to go. And something that we will find is that it's easy to backwards rationalize anything. A lot of our cognitive functioning is dedicated towards reminding ourselves how great we are, how, you know, we've made, we make great decisions today. We were so productive. Look at this big list of things that I crossed off. Didn't matter if any of those weren't our top priority, but like, look at all the things we've done. I did, I did eight hours of work today rather than, well, if I can only accomplish one thing today and have the day be great, what would that thing be? And you spend, you know, I like to say the first 60 to 90 minutes of your day working on that thing, you could treat the whole rest of the day as a bonus, that the most important thing on your list is more important than everything else combined. And so items numbers two through 10 aren't like nice to haves, they're distractions. There's a famous Warren Buffett story where he's like, you know, what are your top 20 goals? People are like, da, 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 da. oh, goal number 19, I want to learn how to swing dance or, you know, whatever it is. And he's like, okay, so these five, and I always say it's like probably one to three, these are the things that you're doing. And someone's like, oh, so like number five through 20, these are the things that we do like when we're not doing one to five. It's like, no, that's your not to-do list. Like those are the most dangerous things at all because those are things that you can justify in hindsight is, oh, we redesigned the website or like, oh, now we have a new uh, recruiting page. Well, you know, was that was that your most important thing? Was that attacking your bottleneck? Well, no. Well, it was literally a waste of time. And most of the things we do as work are a waste of time because we don't just take a single minute to say what would move us forward the most, what's the most effective path. And yeah, that's why planning is so critical because the more rational we are, the better we are at rationalizing. We can look backwards and justify anything that we do. And third, we'll say pillar of, the, of that loop, the experimentation and why I think it's it's so critical. We've, we've danced around a little bit, but I think it'd be nice to make explicit. Yes. All right. So we just talked about planning, deciding what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. We talked about reflection. How did that thing we do go? Can we make it go even better? Can we do something different? All right. But in between the doing of the thing I like to frame as experimentation is that we're curious, we're constantly paying attention to like, is what we're doing leading us to the place that we want to go? And I know a problem that I used to have and a lot of the founders that I work with have is this shiny object syndrome is like dramatically shifting the, the business model or the, or the marketing plan day after day. Like I find that this experimental approach solves for that. It eliminates a lot of these daily existential crises and pivots in the opposite direction because you choose an experimental period. 
So for me, I default to 30 days where every month I set kind of general North stars, things I want to work towards, things that I'm going to try and see what happens. And I sprint as fast as I can for that 30 days, trying to like have this mental superposition of even though I'm only 70% sure, I'm going to act like I'm 100% sure that like this is the goal that I want, right? And this avoids me changing the goal every single day. Because as we know with systems thinking, if you change the goal the whole system realigns itself in that goal. And so that's very dangerous because, you know, if you're changing everything, how do you know what's working? And then in the 30 days, I have the power to say, I can scrap that entirely. That gives me the freedom to act as if I'm fully confident. And it's so much of this coming down to like having the conviction that what you're doing is leading to the place that you want to go. And that allows you to remain consistent. I love the William James quote about habits because I think it extends to so much in life. A single lapse is like letting a whole ball of string unfurl. Hmm. You know, you're doing all of this work wow. to like build this this string just wrapping and wrapping and wrapping and you you fall off course, you you lose confidence what you're doing, you're starting over. You have just a big piece of string all over again. And this ability to know that you can course correct at a designated time allows you to experiment and try things in a low risk, fun, curious way. If everything is this like willpower, like force yourself to do things, that's a sprint. That's not a marathon. That's not a long-term approach. So I find in combination, deciding what I'm going to do, doing it, being curious what happens, and then how did that go? Do I want to keep doing it or I want to do something else? When that loop is closed, it allows for exponential growth. So I want to now transition a little bit. And one of the things I love about working with you is you had a few like simple, cheap tools that you recommended that at the time I was like, this sounds so silly. And I've shared this, you know, many times now with many other people. And I commonly get the same reaction of people like, that sounds really silly. But one of them was something super simple, which is literally a $20 cube timer that you can get on Amazon. And that is still something I use. And like something that's core to the way that I work is uh, just, yeah, you've got it right there. It's just this notion of, um, you know, either time boxing. So saying, I want to do this thing. It's a potentially an open-ended task. So I'm just going to give myself this amount of time. I'm going to work on it for 30 minutes. I'm going to work on it for 60 minutes and then I'm going to stop. Or um, the other one is, you know, trying something where it's more of a sprint, where it's like, I don't have a ton of time to work on this today. I want to challenge myself. You know, I may do one or two of these in a day and it's kind of a nice change of pace, but it's more just like, I'm going to sprint on this and see how much I can get done in 15 minutes or 30 minutes or just challenge myself and say like, I know realistically it might take me, you know, 25 minutes. I'm going to see if I can get this done in 15 minutes, but it's so simple and so powerful. Like, do you have other tools like that? And what are some of the either software or physical tools that you lean on in, in, in your life? Yeah. Uh, first, the the cube timer. So I'm sure a lot of listeners are familiar with Pomodoro's and, you know, the power of time boxing is that, you know, time conforms to the space that we give it, right? Ta classic Parkinson's law task expands to the amount of time that we have to work on that task. If anyone who's worked on a team project knows this, you know, thing, things miraculously get finished at the deadline, no matter when the deadline is. It goes back to our, what we're talking about habits, making it so low that you can't say no. So much of procrastination is a failure to get started. And so, you you know, how do you write an essay? You, you write the first word, and then you write the first sentence, then you write the first paragraph. And I'd like to talk about it as a verb change from like, what's the smallest possible step of going from, I'm going to do this thing to I'm doing this thing. And a lot of that is just lowering the bar for how far I need to go before I can take a break, before I can celebrate. And so for me, you know, I default to operating in 25 minute cycles following a break. But a lot of times I will set a timer for five minutes and say, for the next five minutes, I'm only going to do this thing. And that works as like, oh, I'm really stuck between these two options. All right, for the next five minutes, I'm going to write down all the arguments for both in the end of five minutes. I'm going to make a decision because most decisions are like, am I having chicken or steak for dinner? And I'm like, it doesn't really that matter all that much, but eventually I get hungry. So I need to make a decision. It's like minimizing that time to allocate to something, creating that constraint. But I just need to do anything to get started. And so it's like setting that bar as low as possible. The opposite part of time boxing, which I think a lot of people miss, goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning as far as sprinting the wrong way as fast as they can, is if you limit the amount of time that you're sprinting, 
with this interval of, okay, now I'm going to take a step back and say, I'm going to continue this. And so I, I think for me, a classic one recently is I'm working on a new web page. It's very easy to get in the weeds with a new web page, as I'm sure you know as a designer, Daniel. Yeah. And so every 25 minutes, it's like, oh, okay, well, is this actually like the best thing that I could be doing? Do I really need to rewrite this paragraph? And it creates that, that rail where things don't go off the rails. That being said, other kind of tools or, or like cheap things that I think are pretty interesting. And the reason that I think they're interesting is because by, by experience, they install these, these principles. Like you're saying, like a simple timer, but that helps you internalize these, these principles of creating time boxes. I would point, I point everyone listening. I mean, I, I assume there's going to be a show notes. Um, yes, you know, absolutely. I have, a, I have a popular post last year called Top, resources for productivity and performance. And so that's the list of everything that I use with the rationale and how I use it. And so, you know, definitely check those out. Themes that that come to mind, you know, one, anything you can do to track, especially passively, is super useful. You know, never underestimate the power of a rising integer. So you know, I have like, you know, Aura sleep tracker on there, time trackers, you know, tracking where your time is going online, all these these types of things that help make things that are subjective more objective and thus make, help you make better decisions, I think are always very high leverage tools, you know, very into capturing ideas. I'm, I'm a super analog guy. So it's like I have like literally a, a yellow pad next to me that I'm just writing down any random thought that comes up during the day. And the key is I want to re- minimize the amount of friction between having an idea, thinking of something I could do and like capturing it in some form. And then I just go back and I do what it calls a sweep, go through these notes and see if there's anything actionable. A $1 yellow pad for me, like I, I wouldn't sell this pad for a thousand bucks. Another one that I'll talk about, especially for those who spend a lot of time online, are blockers. If you're starting with one, I really recommend Freedom. So that's just like during the hours that you're doing your work, especially your deep work, blocking all the things that could be distractions. One interesting correlation that I found with the executives that I work with and their productivity is the first time that they check their email is the strongest negative correlation with how much they get that done in the day. The earlier they check the email, the less that they get done. And it will blow someone away to discover like the world will not catch on fire if you don't check your email for a couple hours. But that if you spend a little bit of time on your most important thing of the day before you flip over to the world, you'll just feel so much more sane. Your most important projects will move forward. Um, it's, it's amazing what that, that tiny shift will make. Do you have any final words you want to share? And can you give people um, a few places where they can you know, find you online, be able to follow you and work with you? There's a couple of places that I would direct you. I have a workbook that I think encapsulates a lot of the concepts that we were talking about today in a form that anyone can implement. Uh, it's called Experiment Without Limits. And it's available for anyone to download for free online on, on our website. So that's uh, theforcingfunction.com slash workbook. It's also available on Amazon at cost. I, mean, I highly recommend the paperback version. Having a physical thing that you can write in tends to increase your odds of putting the things into practice. But the other place I'd, I'd say that we talked about so much today. And so there's always all these places that you can improve yourself. And so it's easy to get overwhelmed and thus not, not take action. So we created a little quiz that we called the performance assessment, which um, asks you a few questions about what's going on in your life, what's holding you back, the things that you have in place. And you know, through that quiz, it'll reveal what we think is your biggest opportunity to improve your performance. Um, so you can also take that for free at theforcingfunction.com slash assessment. If you are interested in accelerating performance, we do have an opportunity. I generally only work with a handful of executives at a time, but for the first time, I'm opening up to a group for what we call team performance training. So I'm going to be leading this group for 12 weeks. It's going to be executives, investors, founders through my system for achieving peak performance. And we're going to do lots of fun kind of peer masterminds and uncovering each other's blind spots and just pushing ourselves. That kicks off at the beginning of September. And so applications for that are opening up in mid-August. So if you uh, want to receive more information on what all that's about, you can go to teamperformancetraining.com. 
And I would just reiterate, I've gotten a tremendous amount out of working with him. And obviously, we've talked about a lot of concepts, but in a very general, broad sense. So if you're interested in just seeing what this could do for you, could do for your performance, I guarantee you would take away some things that I'm sure are obvious, but a lot of stuff that's counterintuitive and a lot of stuff that's highly tailored to just things that would help you specifically. So I can't recommend working with Chris enough. Thank you so much, Chris. Until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. For show notes, including links to anything and everything mentioned in this episode, please go to outliers.fm. If you enjoyed this episode, sign up for my weekly newsletter. You'll be the first to hear about new episodes before they're released, and you'll get the best quotes, themes, and ideas from each episode in a weekly update I call Inside the Episode. To sign up for that, just go to outliers.fm slash newsletter. Just two more things before you take off. Number one, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review in iTunes. My amazing team and I invest countless hours planning, researching, and editing each episode because we want all of them to be amazing. And we hope you enjoyed listening. If you did, please consider taking 30 seconds to leave a short review in Apple Podcasts or iTunes. Reviews are crucial in helping us get the best guests and helping more people find outliers. So if you have 30 seconds, please take a moment and leave a short review. Thank you so much. Number two, if you haven't already, sign up for my Friday Five newsletter. Each Friday, you'll get a short email where I share the coolest things that I've been using, loving, and pondering each week. Those include new products I'm trying, supplements I'm experimenting with, people I've been studying, books and articles I've been enjoying, and so much more. It's super short, it's filled with awesome and interesting stuff, and it's a great way to get inspired each week as you head into the weekend. To get access, go to friday5.email. That's F-R-I-D-A-Y-F-I-V-E dot email. Thank you so much.